internet and welcome to my Fortran tutorial. In the description underneath the video you'll find a clickable taggable of contents for this entire video as well as a cheat sheet and a transcript of the entire video and I have a lot to do so let's get into it. Okay so for this tutorial I'm going to be using G Fortran or GNU Fortran and it, it doesn't really matter though what you use for Fortran everything's going to be exactly the same and if you want to get it you can just go to gccgnu.org wiki G Fortran or just type in G Fortran in Google. And after thinking about this for a while, I decided to just use a Atom text editor as well as a terminal. This works on Windows as well as on Macintosh. Either one doesn't matter. Okay, to start off, what we're going to do is we're going to type in program. And I'm going to call this uh, Fortran Tut, just so it's easy to understand what's going on. And then you would go about ending your program by going end program and then follow that up once again with the name of your program. All right, so I'm going to basically cover the core syntax of the entire Fortran language. So basically this one video is pretty much like reading a 300 page book on Fortran. What we're going to do here first is we're going to say implicit none. And what that means is it's going to force you to declare all of your variables. And I'm going to do a simple little example here that's going to show how to display as well as receive input from our user. What I want to do here first, there's a couple ways to do this. I'm going to show you pretty much every way. Let's say I want to create a variable that is a string. It is a, a character array and I want to call it name. Now what I'd like to do, and I'm going to show you numerous ways to output information. This is the most basic and not necessarily the best, but I want to show you everything. So let's say I say, what's your name? Not just what's a name, so what's your name? And this is going to output on our screen. As you can see here, we're not using semicolons. Then if I wish to read in input and store it in the variable that we just created called name, all I do is go read and then I say where I want that data to be stored. And then I can go and output information as well. So I'm gonna say print and everything's gonna be sort of right justified inside of Fortran by default. I'm gonna keep it that way just for now and then I'm gonna change it here in a second or I'll show you how to change it. And then if we want to then say hello and follow that up with the name that they entered, that's what we do. And I can come over here. If you wanna compile your program, you just go G Fortran, Fortran tut F90 is the extension we're using. And basically the F90 extension can be used with Fortran 2003, basically anything up to date. So just so you know that is, or what that is. And then I'm going to be able to output this code just by going like this. It's gonna say, what's your name? I'm gonna type my name in and it's gonna say, hello, Derek. All right, so very, very simple example. Now we'll get into some more complicated things. Let's go and let's create another. And one thing you have to know about Fortran is whenever you are defining your variables they have to come up here at the very beginning of your code and I'm going to define two different characters here so I'm going to say character and I'm going to say that I want the total length to be equal to 20 and I'm going to say that I want that to be true for a first name as well as a last name once again we could have what's your name just put inside of here so let's just leave that exactly the way that it was however what we're going to do now is we are going to receive both these variables and and they are going to be divided up based off of if there is a space between them. So I can just go read and exactly like we did before. And I can say L name like that. And then I can come down here once again, hello. And we're going to change or we're going to put first name inside here. But what I want to do first is to trim off any excess white space, which is going to be needed since I said that these are going to be 20 characters in length. And we can throw a space in here, just separating everything with commas. And then once again, and trimming, and there we are. And now you'll be able to see that we'll be able to come over here and run this and run it and say, Derek Bananas, and there we go. And you'll see that it comes back out. All right, so very simple ways to input and output information. And now I wanna talk more about variable types as well as data types. Okay, so it's very important to remember that variables must start with a letter and then you can have letters, numbers, or underscores. And another thing that's important to remember is that variables are case insensitive. Let's say you wanted to declare a constant, which is just a value that will not change. 
per, uh, real basically means that this is going to be a double or a number or a float or a uh, value that or does contain decimal places. All right, I'm going to call this pi and then I'm going to say something like 3.1415. Okay, so there you go. The parameter part here is going to say that this is a constant. So let's go in and define another real type or float or whatever you want to refer to it. And you are going to be able to both define as well as provide values whenever you first create your different variables. So I'll just keep this nice and simple. Real num2 is equal to 0.0. .0. Okay, so there are those default values that I've defined. Another type that is available to you if you want a lot of precision, real by default are only going to have six digits of precision, while a double is going to provide you with 15 decimals and just pay particular attention right here where we have d plus zero at the very end of it that is going to be needed if you want to use doubles to get more precision and if we also have integers of course and we're just going to put colon and i and num one is equal to zero all right so that's how we define integers we're also going to have boolean types but they are called logical types inside of fortran and it can just come in here and do something like can votes and you're going to use either dot and true or followed with another dot or put false inside of there for logical operators or logical variables also going to be able to come in and define strings like I did previously with length being equal to 10 let's say we wanted to store month inside of there and then you're also going to have complex types and we can just go complex num is equal to 2.0 and 4.0 okay so there we are those are some different types for you and if you wanted to get the largest value for a different type what we can do or all of the different types let's say i wanted to come in and get the biggest real value that was available to us well we could just come in and just go huge and then throw a real variable inside of there and then we're going to be able to do this also for integers so let's do that and just change this to int and we'll just change this to i for integer you're also going to be able to get the smallest values throw that inside of there change that to smallest and to get that you're going to type in tiny do the same thing for our integer integer and then another function that's available to you is kind which is going to return the number of bytes for each of our types and let's do something a little bit fancier here with print now so this looks a little bit nicer if you want to have everything be formatted a little bit better what you do if you have a string is put an a and the number of spaces you want set aside and if you have an integer you put an i and the amount of space put aside for that and you're going to see how much better that looks i can then come in and do int and then we can do kind and again just throw in an integer variable inside of there and let's go about doing this for or other different data types that are available let's change this to five and all the code is available in the description so if you want it and it's free of course you can just go and get that and if you I'm moving a little bit fast hit that pause button and go through the entire video at your own speed and this is going to be a double and I'll just throw a double type double num and then we'll also do a logical just for the heck of it and then we'll change this to can vote come over here and we go and we execute it so did I type in wrong oh and I forgot that's not going to work for that integer type so let's just get rid of that no problem and let's go and execute it and you're going to see all those different values and how large they are and here you can see the number of bytes that each of the different data types are or have available to them all right so more on that and more on all the different things we can do math wise inside of Fortran now I want to get more into formatted output with print now the most basic form of using print is going to be this guy and let's say we have something like i number and then i follow that up with 10. as you are going to see that is going to be right justified by default but i'm going to show you how all the cool things we can do here so basically integers are going to be formatted like this where you're going to have r i and w and basically the r is going to be or represent the number of times to use what follows per line and the w is going to define the width to take up for each value let me show you in examples exactly what i mean by that 
So I'm going to say print, and I'm going to say that what follows formatting wise is going to be done three times, and that is going to be integers that take up five in space. And then I can go seven, six, and eight. And let's go and do another example here just to show you something else. Let's go and just copy that and throw that down there. And here what I'm going to do is get rid of the three just so you can see exactly what that means and everything else stays the same. And there you can see. So in this situation, we are going to say we want five spaces for each of these individual digits and here when we leave the three out what it does is put them on two separate lines whenever we output that information floats are going to have even more things they can do because they also have decimal places so with a float you're going to have again repeat the formatting code that follows how many different times represented with R F for the float W is going to define the same as above which is going to be the width to take up for each you're gonna have a dot and then you're gonna have the number of decimal places that you would like to output and I'll show you an example of that so we'll go print and this and I'm gonna say I want this to be done two times this for formatting F and 8.5 and then after that I can put two different values inside of here and know that they are going to print out the way that I want them to so 1.234 simple enough and there you can see how they output on our screen all right so that's how we format those we're also going to be able to format characters and let's say also that you would like to put a new line inside of your formatting what you do is just put a forward slash like that and a comma and in here they're going to be defined with the number of times and then the total width for each one so I'm gonna say 2 a and let's say 8 then after that I can come in and I can do something like name and then and age and if we run it you can see how those all lay out there's also going to be exponential notation available to you and for that we're going to use e and I'm going to say something like 10.3 and that's going to work very similar to how floats are going to work so we can go one two three and then four five six and there that works you're also of course going to be able to use multiple types because I already demonstrated that but I'll demonstrate it again so we can say a is going to represent strings and five spaces for my string and then I'm gonna have an integer that's gonna take up two spaces and then I can go and say something like I am and leave it like that and then 43 and there it is but you might ask yourself well how would I go about left justifying numbers well you could do something like right and let's go and create a character here remember all of your variable definitions have to come at the top so I'm gonna say length is equal to five and I character so then what we can do is we can go I and character and we can go I five and put parentheses around that and 10 and then we can come in and go print and this is just like a weird thing that gets asked all the time it's the only reason I'm covering it a a there are your strings and then you could say a number comma adjust left I character and there you go a number 10 all right so just another weird way of doing things with using write instead of print all right so there's a couple different ways we can format data now I want to talk about math operators okay so you can pause your screen and type in all of this uh, variable data here or just copy and paste from the code in the description basically I'm going to show you demonstrations of how precision works I'm going to generate random numbers and so forth and so on so what are we going to do here first well I'm just going to show you the math operators that I said I was going to use so I'm going to say that I want a string that is eight in space and an integer and then I'm gonna come in and go something like five plus four is equal to and of course we're going to be able to add values inside of Fortran and we're going to be able to do more than that obviously okay so we'll also be able to come in and subtract values and you can see I'm able to perform all this directly inside of our print command and five times four and let's change this to two because we know we're going to have to accommodate two values there we could also do a division very commonly you're going to also use modulus so I'm gonna go in here you don't use the percent sign inside of Fortran but I'm gonna leave it there and 
and we can instead come in and use mod and five, whoops, divided by four. And modulus gets just, just gives you the remainder of a division. And also I'll demonstrate uh, exponentiation. And that is done just by putting in a two multiplication symbols. And if you run that, you can see that you get the results you were expecting. And now I wanna demonstrate how precision works. So this is going to be floats, of course. And like I said before, floats have six digits of precision, but I'm going to actually prove that. So I'm gonna go like this and float number plus float num2. And then likewise, I'm going to do similar with double precision just to show you how much more accurate we have here. We're still going to use float for that. This is going to be changed to double num though. And this is going to be double num also. And you'll see how that works, but I'm also going to come in here and show you how to make a random number generator. So I'm going to call random number and rand. Then if I would like to generate random numbers between one and 10, this is how you do it. I'm just going to go and get two spaces set aside. And what you would do is you would start with your low value right here and 10, which is the high value. I just did, went and created a name for them just so it'd be easier to understand. So one through 10, you're going to use low plus floor, which is going to round downwards. And then you're going to have high plus one minus low. And then you're going to multiply that times the rand. And if we do all that and execute, you can see we were able to get the precision we were expecting with our double. Here we got the six points of precision we were expecting with our float. And here we got a random number. And if we wanna go and run it again, you can see that the random number keeps changing. So it is indeed random. So there is some information on math operators. Now I wanna talk about math functions. Now there are numerous built-in functions inside of Fortran, but I just went and went and typed in some of the most common ones you are going to use. And if we save that, you can pause your screen, of course, if you wanna take a closer look. But if we go in here and execute that, you're going to see the results on the right side of the screen. I didn't set enough space aside for the tangent here. And it's important to understand that whenever you're working with these trigonomic functions here, that they are going to use radians and not degrees. Okay, so I didn't wanna waste a lot of time with that. Now I wanna talk about conditionals. Now with conditionals, you're you're going to have relational operators like equal to and not equal and greater than and less than or greater than or equal to or less than and equal to and of course I'm going to show you examples using all of the above likewise you're going to have logical operators that are going to be and as well as or as well as not and that is how they are going to be used now I'll show you how to use them with an example uh, in regards to if else if and so forth and so on so let's create an integer and let's call it age is equal to 16. We're now gonna be able to come in and say age, if, if age is greater than or equal to five and age is less than or equal to six, then in that situation, I wanna execute this specific code, which is just going to print out kindergarten on the screen. Then what I can do is say else if, and let's just copy this to save some time and change this to seven and then change this to 13. And in that situation, we are going to print and we will change this to middle school. Else if, and then we'll come down here and here we're gonna say 14 and and 18 and we'll change this to high school and then finally you can say else which is going to be our default and we can say something like stay home and then to end our if statement we just say end if and if we execute it, you can see that high school comes back as our result. Also wanna cover the logical operators more here. So what exactly does or do? Well, I'm sure you know. It's going to, if either of them are true, it's going to give you back an answer of true, of course, but I just wanted to demonstrate that. Likewise, come in here and not is basically just going to give you the opposite of whatever you give it. 
so we can say not and then we'll just leave that you know i'll change it to true just so you can see how that changes and not equal to we can come in five not equal to nine and that's a logical operator and i guess also i should come in and show you that yes indeed you're going to be able to do this with letters as well we go and you can use single quotes if you'd like and there you can see your results right there on the screen okay so i want to also show you how to do a similar thing using the select conditional operator which is sometimes switch in other programming languages so you're going to go select case and what you're going to be checking for here is age and we'll say case five all right so i'm just abbreviating this slightly just so i can show you multiple different ways you can use this if the value of age is five we're going to get that result and you're also going to be able to do use a range so if the age is between six and 13 you'll be able to do this and then here we'll say middle school and then we'll say case and if your heart desires the option to put in every single one of these well fortran will accommodate that desire by allowing you to list out of course they don't need to be in order like that and anything in there that matches will match for this specific this specific situation and then you also have your default just like you did previously and we'll stay stay home and then to end it you just go and select and there you can see high school comes back once again all right so there are some conditional operator options for you inside of fortran and now i want to talk about looping all right so what we're going to do here is do a little guessing game in regards to using a loop to get the user to enter in multiple different things but first i'm going to do a couple other things so let's uh if you want to loop basically you can use do to do that and what you're going to do here is define n and you can see here n is defined up there first off and what we're going to do is we're going to say what value we want to start at what value we want to end at and how many how much do we want to increment each time or what is the step and we can come in and we're going to output an integer and i think you know how that'll end and then we go and do and there you can see how we were able to cycle through those values now we will do a do while loop and i'm going to do more with looping that i don't necessarily show here because i like to show examples so let's say we want to loop as long as m has a value that is less than 20 and we're going to come in and we're going to well let's go first let's go if and mod m and 2 what this is going to do is only print even values and there's modulus and if the modulus give of uh, a division by 2 gives us a result of 0 then we know we are dealing with an even value so we can say then and we want to print that out on our screen and so we shall and then we will increment the value of m and then if you want to jump back up here to the beginning of the loop you can do so just by by typing in cycle which is continue in m many programming languages and then with the, we will end our if statement here otherwise we will increment the value of m then let's say if we wanted to arbitrarily jump out before we get to 20 we could say if at some point m is greater than or equal to 10 well in that situation we want to exit the loop altogether and start executing code down here outside of the loop well if we want to do that we type in exit we then type in and if and then to end the whole do loop we type in and do oops made an error ah common error inside of fortran here Put the quotes on the outside not the inside and we will run it and there you can see we printed only the even values just as we wanted to and now i'll demonstrate how we can do our little guessing game here well let's just keep uh do while and here what we're going to say is we're going to say n is not equal to and we'll put in our secret number so this is going to continue asking the user to input information until they get it so i'm going to say print and what's your guess 
And then I want to read in that guess. And then I'll have end do. And then if they ever get out of this loop, which I would hope they would, we're going to print a message that just says, you guessed it. Come in here and execute it. What's your guess? And I'm going to type seven and it says you guessed it, but that wasn't any fun. Let's come in and instead execute it. And we'll say five and you'll see that it continues asking forever until I finally type it in and I get it. So way more in regards to looping is going to be coming up here, but now I want to talk about arrays. So if you want to create an integer array, you would just type in integer and comma, and then you have to define the size for it. And I'm going to say that I want five spaces side to side. If I want to have multiple arrays, that's not a problem and we can just type all those in. We're also going to be able to have real arrays as well. So we'll type in this and 50, and let's just call this a R1. We're going to have multi-dimensional arrays. So let's go integer and dimension. So that's a five by five multi-dimensional array, and we'll call that a four. And let's come in and define some integers that I know we're going to need to use. So we'll say N and M and X and Y. We can also define arrays that size is determined at runtime. So to do that, we can just go integer integer and dimension and then inside here just put the colon with no other values and then a comma and then allocatable and that's going to be a five we're also going to come in and store the number of values that we're going to have there so we'll call this number of values and give it a default value of zero and we're going to be able to also come in and define values whenever we create our arrays so we can say dimension we'll say one to nine let's call this a six is equal to and then you just do a forward slash and then put all the values inside of here that you would like to have and I think that's more than enough and then end that with a forward slash as well and then let's go throw another one inside of here uh, integer dimension and let's make this uh, three by three and you'll see what I'm gonna do with that basically I'm gonna show you how to reshape arrays but I'll show you an example will make more sense than that. Okay, so you're going to be able to store values just by referencing a index and all arrays start with the index of one. So we can change that. You're also going to be able to retrieve said values as well. So this is going to be an integer and I can come in and to retrieve the value, just put the array and then your parentheses and the index you're looking for. I said there's gonna be more with loops and so there is. So let's go n is equal to one through five is how we want to cycle through a range we can say a1 and n and we can assign values and we can end our do loop there and then let's come in and let's print out that information just to prove it's there and to do that is a1 once again and the index that we're working with and I got an error because I only put one colon inside of there. And you can see here that we were able to change those values and output them. And here we were able to get our original value that we had stored inside. But let's do some more. You're also going to be able to get a range of values. So let's say I wanna do this three times and in set two si uh, spaces aside for each of those integers. Whoops, let's go like this, three, I, and two. And the array that we wanna work with, then I wanna get the first three values that's how you get that I could also go in and get a range with an increment so let's go two I and two whoops we'll go two I and two and here we'll go a one again and one through three with an increment of two or a step however you want to refer to it we're also going to be able to assign values to multi-dimensional arrays and to do that we can go n is equal to one five and do this all also with M, one and five, and then with our multi-dimensional array, we'll go N and M is equal to, we'll just put N inside of there just to put something in there, and then you have to go and do, and, and do. And let's use the same sort of structure to output 
said information. So we'll just go like that. And then in down inside of here, instead of assigning values, let's go and get values. So I'm gonna say print, and I'm gonna show you other different ways of doing this stuff too. So I can go I1 and A1, I1, A3, and I1. And then I can follow that up with N with a space, M, and then I can throw a colon inside of there and then go and get the actual value, A4, N, N, and M. And the rest of that is perfectly fine. And you can see that we went and printed out that multi-dimensional array. And you can also see up here that I went and got the range and then the range with the odd step increment that we had. Let's go and get rid of this so it doesn't clutter up our output window as well as this guy right here and do a couple more examples. You can also use something called an implied do loop to cycle through an array. So I'm gonna go n is equal to one through five, and then we can go print and five i one, and then this is going to act as our do loop, so or our implied do loop. So you just type in the multi-dimensional array that you wanna work with, and you can do this with regular arrays as well. And I'll probably show you that here in a minute. And then where you, or the range you wanna cycle through after that, and end do. And there you can see we're able to print them out again, maybe in a neater little format. So cool stuff. We're also going to be able to get the size of different arrays. And to do that, you just type in size and then throw in whatever your array is. And let's do this for the multi-dimensional array as well. Just change this to four. And there you can see five and 25, the total number of values that are stored inside. Let's go and get a couple more of these guys. You're also going to be able to get the number of dimensions. To do that, we can go rank and a4 going to be able to get the elements in each of the different dimensions by using shape you can type in shape or shape do either one both of them work and there you can see our, our result oh and i said we we're also going to define the array size at runtime that's this guy right here so that's a5 so let's do something a little bit neat here we'll say print and we'll allow the user to define how big the array is so we'll say size of array and then down here we can say read and store that into number of values and then to allocate that space we go allocate and the array we're working with and then the amount of space that we want to set aside for set array now what we can do is create another do loop here number of values and then assign values to the array being that these are just going to be those values we cycle through and and do and let's go and output that and let's hack this off the end there there, and then change this to print. Oh, might as well just come in here and do this. And I1, size of array, and we'll say we want eight digits generated, and you can see it generates eight digits and also stores them in an array. We're also going to be able to change all of our values inside of our array instead of just doing it one by one just as you assign them. So we'll go forward slash one, two, three, and six and seven with another forward slash. Just make sure that you have this, the size, you know, the amount of space available in the array to put that inside of there. And here I'll just, I talked about the implied do loop. Let's do it here with a one dimensional array. So I'm gonna say five I one. And then outside of that, we can say A two and M where the range of values for M are going to be between one and five. We're also going to be able to come in and reshape an array. So let's say we have a one by nine array and we want to change it into a three by three array. We can do so. So we'll say a seven is equal to reshape. And here are those variables. Here is a seven up here, right there. See, that's the guy we're working with. So one by nine into a three by three array. And how you do that is go reshape and a six is the one by nine array. And we wanna change it into three by three. So forward slash three comma three and another forward slash and you'll get what you wanted. We can check if a values are equal across one dimension of our array. And to use logical operators, you're going to come in here and put an L and one. So we can say all and then we can say a1 is equal to a2 and that is going to represent the dimension 
the first dimension that we're working with. And we're also going to be able to check if any of them are equal just by changing this to any. Everything else can be exactly the same. We can also figure out the number that are equal just by putting count inside of here. And we will be able to get minimum and maximum values. Change this to I3. Let's have that be I1. And let's do max value of the array A1. And we'll do the same thing for our minimum value. And just to finish off examples of what we can do with arrays, I'm going to get probably more into them later also. We can also get the product and the sum of the dimension for our array. So if we wanted to get the product, just type product in there and if we wanted to get the sum we just type sum and I type two A's inside of there should have caught that internet and whoops I forgot to get rid of that let's change that to five and there you can see the results of all of our code that we have right there. So there is a whole bunch of information about arrays. And now I want to talk about format. Okay, so I went and created a couple different variables here to start off. And basically the format statement has a numbered label and you are going to pass values to it that will fit into the designated formatting. So let's go and do another do loop here. I'm going to say num and let's go one through 12 and then I can say print and 100 there is our label and then num and then num times seven just arbitrary thing and basically now we have format and you can see there's the 100 in front of it and it is going to receive a value here and I'm going to say that this is an integer I want two spaces and just to show you that we can use single quotes I'll do this times seven is going to be equal to and then the amount of space that I want set aside for the next one. And then I can say and do like that. And if we run it, you can see that it cycles through and outputs all of that information. So let's do another example here. Let's do a nice layout. So I'm gonna say print, and I'm gonna say that I want a new line and A and 18 for our uh, string that we're gonna put inside of here. And then I can say cups and liters and quarts. So we're gonna do some calculations and then do cups is going to be equal to 1 through 10 and then we'll do leaders calculation which is going to be cups times point 236 and quarts is going to be equal to whatever cups is times 0 0.0208 and then we will call our format statement with the 200 and cups and pass in leaders and pass in quarts quarts and then we will do our quarts this all right and then we will do the actual format statement which is going to be 200 and format and then define what we want to do here let's say we want to do let's stick with our single quotes let's say we want to put a space inside of here and then three spaces you can also do spaces 2x like that that's going to give you two spaces and we can go and do our floats and then let's say we want another two spaces and then again float 5.3 and then end our do loop again, and you'll see that we get a nice little table that's printed out here. Whoops, I forgot to put my parentheses inside of here. So parentheses there and parentheses there, and let's do this again. And you can see here, we get a nice little, you know, filtered table that comes out. All right, so there's an example of format, probably do a little bit more with it later, but now I wanna talk about strings. All right, so I showed you how to create strings previously. It's just a character array, so it has a length total space of 30 characters that we can store inside of it and you can pause your screen and go and type that in if you'd like now basically if we want to join strings we could just go and get string three here and say equal to and if we want to trim the white space off of the strings we just use uh, trim like that and then if we want to concatenate or join them we can come in and just put those two forward slashes like that and now we did that also if you would want to trim just on the right you would just go adjust 
right. And if you want to just trim the white space on the left, you would do adjust left. And those are functions. So just throw your string in there and you are set. And then we can come in and we can print that string. Let's go do a couple more things. You can also get a substring. So print and let's do string three and say we want the first three characters. We can find the index of a substring as well. So let's come in here. Let's say string space that we want there. And then an, an integer. And we could say index at and then follow that up with index. And you're going to be the string you are searching for and then the actual word you are searching for. We're going to be able to get the size that we want just by using a length on whatever string we are working with. And then you're going to also be able to do all the things we did with arrays previously. And if we come in here and we run this guy, you can see I'm a string that as longer comes out, you're going to see that we were able to get this substring right here. And we were also able to get the index that was for string and the total length, which is 30, which we already know. All right. So just a quick, brief little overview of strings since we've covered them a lot already and also covered them as arrays. And now I want to talk about structures. Now, basically, structures are going to allow you to define custom types, which can contain multiple values of different data types. And how you create one, just go type, and I'm going to call this customer, and I'm going to create a string inside of here that is going to have a length that is going to be equal to 40. We'll designate that as name. Then we'll throw an in integer inside of here, which will be the age of our customer. And then a real, which is going to be maybe a balance that they owe us or something like that. And then you just go end type and customer. And there it is, it's ready to go. Then what we can do is just go type and customer and we'll do sort of similar things with modules later on, which are really neat. And we can say, dimension and let's say we want five total customers let's go and create an integer inside of here which is just going to be n and then let's also come in and create a customer and to do that you just go type and reference your custom structure that you created customer and let's just call it customer one we're then going to be able to assign values by going customer one and name and the this can be Sally Smith if you would like it. We could then also come in and assign an age to it. So we'll say 34 and then we'll also assign a balance. You can see that we're doing that. And let's say she owes us $320.45. We could then come in and assign a structure to an array. So we'll go customers one is gonna be equal to customer one and that's set and also we would be able to assign values independently to the array by going customers and put it in the second space that we have there and then you're just going to reference the name just like you did before and then we can come in and do this for all of the other different amounts also so we can say age and change that to 42 and then come in here again and balance and let's say he owes us 220 $29.78 just to do something weird. And now what we'll be able to do is cycle through these arrays and print out information. So we'll go n is equal to one through two, which is all we have. And then we can come in and output customers n using the array and then n do. And if we execute it, you can see that it prints out Sally Smith and Tom May along with all that information. And of course I could have used trim and things like that individually to get those and have them form Format better. So a quick example of a structure. Now I want to talk about functions. All right, so I went and created a couple different variables here. And basically, if you want to work with functions, you are going to have a, you're going to start creating them after the keyword contains. And basically, there's a couple different ways to do it. What I'm doing here is I'm defining the return type for the function. And then I'm going to type in function and then whatever the function's name is. And then the attributes that are 
passed to the function. And we're going to put implicit none in here once again. And then we can define our different data types that we want. So here's n1, and here is n2. And then we're also going to create sum. And then the last value defined is what is going to be returned from our function in this situation. I'm going to show you other things here in a second. And then we just say end function get sum. And there it is. Now what we can do is come up inside of here. And a lot of times in Fortran, you'll use a main function, but just to keep things simple, I didn't. All right. So let's go and call it. And well, we can do this. You can come in and do something like answer is equal to get sum and then pass in five and four. And then we could go and print that out. So we'll go print and say we want to get a string inside of here and then a integer so we'll go five plus four is equal to and then follow that up Oop, five plus four is equal to and then throw our answer inside of there and there it is right there okay so there's our first example of a function we can work with which we're going to keep creating a whole bunch more. Let's say we want to define a function and then define what is going to be returned. So here we'll say get sum, uh, let's just call it get sum two. And once again, it's gonna get two values passed inside of it. And then if you wanna define the name of the variable that is going to be returned, you just do it like that. Again, we're going to do implicit none. Then if you would like to set up your function so that the variable values that are passed inside of it can't be changed, what you're gonna to do here is go integer intent in and then you can reference your two variables that you have we're still going to need some created here so let's create that and then let's go and get sum is equal to n1 plus n2 and then once again end our function and this is going to be get sum2 instead and here what i'll do is i'll actually call the function directly inside of here so let's just get rid of that all together and i'm just going to come up here and go get sum2 and pass the five and the four inside of that and of course that's going to work perfectly and there you can see it did work all right so more on functions i'm going to create a whole bunch of them here so we can look at different things you're also going to be able to block functions from changing input variables but just by putting the pure keyword in front of it so we can go function and get some three again we're getting values passed inside of it we're going to say that we want our results to be the variable we define called sum we're going to use implicit none again go and grab this guy right here throw both of them inside of it it's also important to know that arguments don't need to have a value passed and if you want to protect from the user not sending everything in you can say intent in and then put optional down inside of there and n2 and then we can also come in and define our sum and then what we can do to check if a value has been assigned is we go present and then n2 which is the thing we don't know if it exists or not and then we'll say then and perform our sum calculation so this will be n1 plus n2 so if a value was passed we're going to do that and otherwise we are not going to do that so we'll say sum is equal to n1 plus 1 and then end that if statement and then of course end our function all together and there is the end of the function all right and then we can come up here and go get sum three and then let's not pass a value inside of it let's get rid of this extraneous stuff and there you can see that we were able to use the default value since one was not passed inside of it we are also going to be able to use recursive functions inside of fortran and a recursive for uh, function is just one that calls themselves repeatedly and let's just have integer up here and let's create our recursive function you have to actually say that it's a recursive function function in Fortran. So we'll say recursive and function, and we will calculate factorial, and that is going to get a value. And then we will say results, and let's just have that be O. We can define an integer inside of here and say N and O. Then we can say if N is equal to one, then whenever you're calling a function in recursively like this, you always have to have a situation in which if something occurs, we we cease to call the function. So that's just a rule with recursive functions. And here we'll say O is equal to one and else, if that is not true, O is gonna be equal to N 
times, and here is where we call our function once again, and it's just going to be n minus one is the rule for factorials. If you don't know, or if you don't know what a factorial is, here I'll explain it briefly, and then we'll just end the if statement that we have there, and then end the function all together. There we go. And now what we'll be able to do is come up inside of this guy right here. And I'm going to say something like a 15 and then go and put factorial and four in this situation is equal to, and we'll do answer just to keep everything on one page. And then we'll come in and I uh, will call our factorial function. So factorial and four for that guy. And if we run it, whoops, I didn't get it enough space just sort of three inside of there and you can see that we got 24 as our answer and if you're wondering how exactly that works basically the way factorial works is whenever you first start off you're going to pass in a value of four into this guy let's go get rid of that so you can see this a little better all right so you pass in four to the factorial comes down inside of here this isn't true it goes and gets four times and then it calls the factorial function once again for three which jumps down to this part so here we have four and we don't have six yet and we jump down here we do this calculation three is right there we don't have this value to get it we jump down here you can see this is the situation in which we get the one that gives us a value of two which jumps up here which gives us a value of six which jumps up here which gives us the final value of 24 and that is just a brief overview of how recursive functions work and now what I want to do is show you a neat example in which we're going to use a generic function in a module that's going to allow us to work with with integers and reals using exactly the same function name. So to create a module, what we're going to do is come over here in our Fortran code and I'm gonna say new file and I'm gonna call this malt mod and this is gonna be F90 as well. And there that is. And let's create a module. So we will say module and malt mod is going to be the name of it. And again, we're going to use implicit none inside. I'm gonna give you another more complex example of how to use mod modules, but basically here you would define your private variables. I'm going to say that malt is going to be public, which means it can be accessed from anywhere in your code. Private means it can only be accessed inside of this module itself. And what we're going to do here is we're going to define two functions that we will associate with the one singular malt function we're going to create. And we're going to get different results based off of the input data types. So so we're going to create an interface here. And what we're going to do is basically define our two functions that we're going to create in this module here. That's all we're doing. So we're going to create malt real and malt int. And then we can end that definition by saying end interface malt. Then what we'll do is define our functions. So contains and then we're going to say that we're going to return a real and then function. And this is malt real and it's going to receive n1 and n2 we are going to go and say that we want to, don't want to change these values this is going to be input into here and that's going to be n1 and n2 they're both going to be real values and then we are going to provide a real result which is going to be product and product is going to be equal to whatever these two values are multiplied times each other and then we will end our function malt real and that's going to allow us to work with real values as well as integers as you will see we're going to do a similar function here but this is going to be malt int and this is going to return an integer and then this is going to also be an integer and this will be an integer like i said i'm going to give you a more detailed example of how we can use modules here in a minute but this is all we're going to do for now and then and after we define that, whoops, make sure I change this to malt int as well. And then we can say end module malt mod. All right, so there is the entire module we have. Now, if we jump back over into our main program, we need to define inside of here that we want to actually use that module. And how we do that is before anything else, we type in use malt mod, and that's going to allow us access to it, but we need to compile these properly. But we also need to come in here and actually call 
all the code, so we'll do that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say print, and then define that we want to have some space for our string, and then this is going to be an integer that we are going to output on the screen. We will then say five times four is equal to, and then go and call our function by just saying malt instead of anything specific, five and four. And then we will, let's just go and do this like this, just to show once again that we can do it. And here you'll see that we're using malt again, but we are going to be using real value and it's going to go and automatically get the right thing. And then we can come in and grab this and paste that in there. And let's see, I think this should be 12 instead. 12, and then we're going to define this as a float. So F, or it's a real, but I, I just call it a float. And then that should be enough space. And then we'll say 5.3 and 4.4. And then we're going to just go R answer. So you can see there's malt with integers there's malt with real values and there is our real answer that we are expecting but remember we need to properly compile this and to properly compile it you're going to type in gfortran again with the dash c malt mod and also your fortran tut as long as i typed everything right which it doesn't look like i did whoops one thing i forgot was to actually reference malt and tie it together with these two separate functions and let's see if that corrects all those problems. Falling back on bad habits using other programming languages, change that to integer. This is again in the malt mod. Run it again and it looks like it worked that time. Then we're going to need to come in here and go like this, gfortran and put dot o at the end for both of those run it and then see if we got the result we wanted. No, we didn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fix this error as well. Well, I labeled this as an integer instead of a real. <laughs> fix that. Yes, I do make errors and I don't cut them out because I don't want you to think I'm perfect. Okay, so let's go and let's go and do this again. And there you can see we got the results that we were expecting, even though we put in completely different data types that automatically worked. So cool stuff. And we're going to do more with a more advanced uh, example with modules here in a minute. But now I'd like to talk about subroutines. Now, the neat thing about subroutines is they allow you to return multiple values and you're going to use contains once again to define them. And I'm gonna go subroutine and I'm gonna call this plus two and it is going to receive a value. And then we're going to add one to it and then add two to it. So we'll go plus one and plus two. All right, so then we'll define our different data types and intent once again so that that is not changed and that'll be n and then we can define inside of here the results that the subroutine is going to provide and we do that by intent out and that tells us that we're going to be returning more than one thing and what we'll return is plus one and plus two so this is going to be our output and then we just calculate those and it will automatically return them because we say that we wanted it to and plus two is equal to n plus two to end our subroutine we go end subroutine and the name of it which is plus two all right now to call it you can see i already created these two integers up inside of here to call the subroutine you go call and then the name of the subroutine you want to call and of course you're going to pass in some values as well as the values that will be returned so plus two and then what we can do is say print and print out that information so we can say i1 and if we want to go and put a new line inside of there we can do that and I1 once again and another new line and then I1 again and then go and actually get them and print them so P1 and P2 and come over here whoops I hit the wrong thing uh, also make sure you get rid of use um, malt mod that was up here I don't want to use that one though I want to use this one that guy right there whoops this is P1 and P2 and execute it and there you can see we we're able to get one two three we were able to return multiple different values using that subroutine so that's a pretty cool feature and now what i want to do is jump over and talk about pointers okay so let's say you would like to define a pointer that points at an integer that's how you would do it and pointer one 
and pointer two. We can also define a pointer to an array integer. So this this pointer and dimension, and let's just call that a pointer one. We can then declare a target whose value is going to change as the pointer's value changes. So once again, integer, and we call that target and target one. We can allocate space for our pointer just by using allocate pointer one and a pointer of course is just referencing a place in memory we can then say pointer one is going to be equal to five and let's go and print some information out here just to show what's going on so we'll do a five and an integer and then we can go something like pointer one and output pointer one we can then come in and associate our pointer with our target so we'll do something like pointer two and how you do that is you go like this and target one and then say pointer one and then say pointer two is going to be equal to one to see how that affects it let's go and increase uh, pointer two's value by two so pointer two just to see how that is going to affect our target and then we can output those changes as well an integer and once again we'll say pointer one and also let's come in and let's go and show the target target and how the target's value changed. This, that's perfectly fine. And then let's just change this to target instead, and then output our target value. And if we run it, you're going to see 0.15, 0.15. You can see that the target, however, is three. And the reason why is target has been tied in with pointer two, has a value of one here. And then whenever we change the value on the pointer, that automatically updated for our target, just like we may have believed that it would. We're also going to be able to come in and disassociate a pointer and a target by just going nullify and pointer two. And also we will be able to deallocate storage for our pointer whenever we don't need it just by using deallocate and pointer one. All right, so real brief overview of some different ways you can work with pointers and targets and so forth and so on. And now I'd like to talk about file IO. And I went and created two different strings here and we're going to be saving information to a file and then reading information from a file and you can pause your screen to go and get that. Another thing that we're gonna have here is an integer and this is going to be an error value. And if this guy is ever given a value other than zero, we know that an error has occurred and we will work with that. We're also going to define a character and this will be 256 and this is going to catch any error messages that we get which we will define here in a, in a second. And now let's go and open and or create a file. So what we're going to do is say open then this is going to be followed with what is called a unit number which must be unique for each file that we decide we want to work with and so i'm just going to put 10 inside of here i think it has to be above nine so just something to remember and file and this is going to be the file that we want to work with you can use single quotes doesn't matter just call this data dat we are then going to define our status which means that this is going to be a new file that we're working with and you put new in there if it's a new file old if it already exists and you want to continue altering it or scratch if you want the file to be deleted after you use it. And then we go IO stat is going to be equal to, here is our error status, which is going to define if an error occurred or not. This is going to be the message that's returned if there is an error. We're going to associate that with error IO message. Then we can come down here and check if there was any errors by going error status and not equal to zero. Well, in that situation, we will write some information out onto our screen, meaning we're going to say error, and then we can go and trim our error message and output it on the screen. Then if an error does occur and you want your program to stop, you can just type in stop and that will end execution. And then this is going to be end if. Okay, so we got the file open. Now, if we would like to write a string to our file, we can come in and say 
right. And again, you're going to have to reference the unique unit number, which is 10 in this situation. And then what you want to write to it after this. So there's string. That's what I called it, right? Yep. And that is going to write to it. And then you can close the file. But that's not very interesting because we need to verify that it actually is there. So if we want to open our file again, again, give it a unique ID. Then we're going to say that we want to open the same file that we had before. So data, dat. Remember I said if we are opening a file that already exists, we want to use status equal to old. And I'm not going to verify that everything worked out. You you know, should do that, but I'm just gonna leave it this way. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that I wanna read information from it. And there it is for our string once again. String two is where we're going to store that information. And then we can say write and let's go. And get our string and trim off any excess white space string two and then once again we will close our file and if we would like to delete the file after we are done working with it you just pass in delete like that and you can see that we were able to write the I am a string to the file and then also read it back okay so cool stuff and to finish off this tutorial I'm gonna do a eh, kind of complicated module example actually I think I'm going to do a couple couple examples, two, two examples. All right, so I'm gonna create a module called shape. So I'm gonna say use shape. And I'm gonna come over here once again, and I'm gonna say I want a new file, and this is going to be called shape, and let's just leave it at that. All right, so here it is. Now let's create it. So module and shape and implicit none and well private like i said before is going to have no access for outside code while public will i'm going to mark both of these as private and i'm going to have height and i'm also going to have weight and this is going to be the first simpler example and then i'm going to make a more complicated example after that let's go give a default value to height as well then you need to declare your subroutines so i'm going to have have public and I'm gonna have set shape as well as if I can spell shape right shape as well as get area and then define them and we have to use contains of course and subroutine and this will be set shape and it's gonna receive height and width and then it is going to be implicit none again and we will say real intent and we'll have whoops define our two values that are passed inside of it which is height and width and then we can just set these values and you can just say height is going to be equal to the h and the width is going to be equal to that and that subroutine and make sure you spell everything correctly <laughs> subroutine and that set shape and then we'll define our other one that we said that we were going to define subroutine get area and let's just have it print out to the screen the area and then we can come in and say height times width and then ends our subroutine and that's get area and then we need to end our module like that all right so there is the entire module right there jump back over here we're using shape like we said we would now to call our subroutine we just go call set shape like that and we can pass in some values let's say 10.5 as well as i don't know 20.5 doesn't really matter just whatever and then we call our other subroutine with get area right like that and if i typed everything correctly we need to compile this differently oops just go like this so we have shape inside of there as our as well as our fortran tut and once again we're going to type in this and then to execute it you can see we calculated our area all right so the first more simplistic module example now we're going to get into some classes as well as how we can inherit from one module into another module this time we're going to inherit two modules one is going to be called shape mod and then the other one is going to be called triangle mod 
So of course we have to create those. So we'll come over here, new file, and this is going to be shape mods F90, and then just define it. So this guy is going to be used to derive from to create the triangle mod. We're going to come in and implicit none, of course, and then we will set our super type, which is going to be shape as abstract so that it can be inherited from for our triangle mod shape mod is marked as abstract but this is going to be shape m in this situation and then we are going to define the variables that all the subtypes are going to receive so that's going to be x and y and then we can define our functions and we're going to have contains we will here we will go procedure and shape and area we're going to mark this as deferred which means that it will be defined in all of our subtypes so we will have get area and then after that we say end type shape m now we can define that we want to return the defined area for each shape in our subclass so how we do that is we say interface and function shape area this which is a reference to this object and then we will say result import shape m define our class as shape m follow that up again with this which is a reference to itself real area which just means area is just a real value and then we need to end our function which would going to be shape area this is going to make a little bit more sense whenever you see it and then interface and then end our module shape mod as well okay so this is basically just setting it up saying that our subclasses are going to have these values and then we are going to also define a function called get area so let's just go and let's create that and uh new file and this is going to be triangle mod f90 let's see what that is triangle mod f90 and create it and now we will just start inheriting as well as defining our get area which was over in our shape mod and it might help make more sense here if you get the code and print it out on two pieces of paper and then compare it because it's hard for me to show both at the same time all right so here's our triangle mod and we want to import our shape mod so that we can do our inheritance so shape mod and remember you always use before we do anything else call the use function implicit number and then we're going to say type extends and shape M and public so that just means we're extending or inheriting from shape M which we uh, provided before and here we'll then go triangle we'll use the same format for this whoops if I can spell triangle right triangle M and then go contains and define the function that you plan to override that was previously in the shape mod so that's going to be procedure get area and then end type triangle M triangle then contains and this this is the function that we said that we wanted to have inside of all our subclasses and it's called get area okay so let's just look at this again say we're saying that we want to come in here and define get area that's what that says and deferred says that we will do that in all our subclasses so we must do it so once again reference to this object itself area is what we will return class triangle there we go m reference to this thing itself real area which is the value we will be returning and then calculate area equal to point five and it's going to automatically work as you're going to see if we want to get the values we just put the percent sign inside of there multiply times this which is this object itself and y and our function get area and then end the module all together all right and then we'll jump back over into our fortran tut we have both of those already set inside of there and the easiest way to really get this to gel in your brain is to think of something you know that you'd like to do calculation wise and go and create one on your own using this as a template now what we can do is since we are going to import those two modules we need to go type and 
triangle M. Those are the, the that's the type that you you know your custom type that you created. And let's just call this try. We can then come in and assign values since they were public. So try x is going to be equal to 10, and try y is going to be equal to 20. And then we'll be able to come in here and calculate these. So we'll just go and get our string and go and get our float or real value x and we can go and get the actual values that we stored inside of there just to show a way to get access to them if you'd like to and this is going to be y and then change this to y as well and then we can come in and print out our area as well so f 6.2 and this is area and to call a function inside of there you just go like that and the function name of course and that is it now I need to compile it and you're gonna put all of the modules inside of there whoops got an error not a big deal let's fix this whoops this is shape area this is in the shape mod file that we have here so set that to shape area and that might have corrected everything and this is how we are going to go and compile this. Once again, put the shape mod in there, triangle mod, and your main file. And it looks like it worked. Once again, go and put that in. Remember, shape mod, triangle mod, fortran, tut. Good. And run it. And it looks like it worked good. All right. So go back over here and you can see what we called and how we were able to output the input that we put inside of there and calculate the area. So there you go, guys. That is a rundown of a lot of the things you can do with Fortran. Hopefully it clears up a lot of things out for you. If you actually stayed this long for the entire video, please take the time to tell me in the comments. I would greatly appreciate that because I don't think anybody watches the entire video. So you are a special person if you did. And like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.